At first pass, <clears throat> I was sure that I was not a person who attached sentimentality to machines. I don't caress my toaster oven. I don't fawn over my phone. But then I thought about how choked up I got when I sold my first car. The way that machine had served me so faithfully growing up. All the memories I had while on the road, driving to and from my first job, taking my first road trip, a place where I could play my music as loud as I wanted. And then I considered the laptop I have stored in my desk at home, the laptop that got me through graduate school, through seminary, the ways that I was so grateful for it, how light it was, how it facilitated me writing so many important pages, how many articles I read and underlined on that glowing screen. Turns out I am more given to sentimentality with machines than I thought. But I felt that I drew the line at robots or rather technology that interacts with us as human. I have had many a debate with friends and family about whether to say please or thank you to Alexa. <laughs> How many of you find yourselves using your most polite manners with your smart home device? Anyone find themselves saying please turn off the lights? For me, there's a part of saying please and thank you to these machines that feels rooted in fear. Like, they might actually be tallying who is nice and who is mean. And on the day the machines take over and come for us, they'll remember who asked you to turn the lights down or the music down with a command or a request. So for a time, I felt that we needed to guard against using manners with Alexa, like that that was the way I distinguished human from non-human. Do I use my manners? Do I think it deserves my respect? There's something innately religious at play here. How I determine who or what is part of that interconnected web. How I determine who or what deserves the dignity that we protect above all else. And by insisting that Alexa is not human and therefore doesn't deserve asking nicely, I'm somehow safeguarding my definition of human. To fold and use my manners with our technology would suggest, would suggest a concession to big tech, like a tiny incremental step that will be convinced that it's not necessary to, be, to distinguish between artificial intelligence and human intelligence. Cultural critic Rory O'Connell writes, ever since Copernicus discovered that the universe does not in fact revolve around us, the notion that human beings hold a privileged place in the cosmic order has been gradually eroded. I felt personally called out when I read this. There is something in me that feels defensive about the specialness of humans. That there is something unique and sacred about us, about how we are made and how we make meaning, that separates us from machines. And that it's worth keeping artificial intelligence at a safe distance. As a religious professional, it feels like I have a stake in making sure we don't let the circuit boards become the beating hearts. That I don't let myself be fooled into service, into slavery, to robot overlords who think faster than we do, who move faster, who express a perfection of knowledge that seems downright intimidating and wrong. I often consider the debates, the richness of conversation had before Google. What happened when we didn't have the ability to declare one person right and one person wrong? When you had to sit in the imperfection of not knowing? Just sit with the wonder. How many of you are the person that says, I know, I can settle this, let me just check my phone? <laughs> I am. I'm aware that nostalgia is at play here. Nostalgia for a world before the singularity loomed large. The singularity referring to the point when human and machine converge and we can no longer determine the difference between the two. This has come up a lot recently, with much ink spilled about the open source chatbot, ChatGPT, which folks are using to write poems, to write essays, to even write sermons. What would happen 
What meaning would be made if the sermon you heard each week came from a network of wires and patches, a synthesis of computing rather than life experience, our conversations, our shared vision for the world? I did actually use AI to write this sermon as I found that using a voice to text app has cut down on my sermon writing time by about two thirds the time. I mean, it's literally revolutionized my week. I speak aloud what I think should be said and it sends me this tidy little manuscript almost completely free of inaccuracies. And a few of the worship associates I've sent drafts to can attest that there are inaccuracies that are still there and make for a good laugh. There's so much about technology and the increasing reliance on it to make the world work. It can feel like a zero sum game that new fangled machines inherently make the world worse, chipping away at our specialness, plucking at our ability to exist unadulterated, naturally. Maybe out of defensiveness, maybe out of fear, I lament the idea of using AI to write a sermon, to write poetry, to write music. It lacks a human touch. It can't be as good. And to be sure, it isn't now, but it will be eventually. What will be lost in that advancement? This kind of thinking was the same as what happened when the photograph was invented, when Le Prince invented the moving image camera, when music became digitized. There's this period of alarm, a period of grief, when we consider this new thing as encroaching on the true art form a threat to the humanity of humans. But in fact, those revolutions expanded the possibility for artistic modes, expanded the possibility for creative outlets, and it expands the possibility for us to labor less and express ourselves more. In a recent interview, Sam Altman, who was the creator of ChatGPT, he actually noted that he prefers naming artificial intelligences with letters and numbers. He states, I really try to make sure we're picking words that are in the tools camp, not the creatures camp, because I think it's tempting to anthropomorphize in a really bad way. Here's the creator, a big name in the game, basically telling me I'm right to wince a little at inviting Alexa with my most respectful tone, basically telling us that this is a tool not another living thing. The interview goes on to explore some harder to understand and harder to imagine scenarios, but it does leave us with an important perspective from the inventor. This is a tool, a tool that cuts both ways. They're extremely helpful and important, and it can be used as a weapon. There is an ominous side to artificial intelligence. There, there is a potential for misuse and exploitation. So proceed with caution, but also with hopeful optimism. Just as the microscope exploded our understanding of the world, so too could AI. My Unitarian Universalism means I have to be skeptical. I'm always a bit of a skeptic about things that get a lot of airtime and money and podcasts and lauded as the next big thing. It's part of our culture to be countercultural. They're all cheering on AI, which means we should probably poo poo it. But my Unitarian Universalism also demands that I dream big, beyond the present moment, to see what could be to let my mind wander and bust out of the confines of our rules, our instructions for how things ought to be. Later in that interview, Sam Altman says, this is going to elevate humanity in ways we still can't fully envision. And our children and our children's children are going to be far better off than the best of anyone from this time. And we're just going to be in a radically improved world we will live healthier, more interesting, more fulfilling lives. Artificial intelligence. It holds the potential for things, for massive things, to cure disease, 
to distribute health information and education. It can reduce the drudgery of our lives. I used ChatGPT two weeks ago to plan a week's worth of meals and generate a grocery list. That's time in my life I got back. That's what my spirit hopes for AI. That's what my hope is for the robots. Don't have it write poetry and music and generate art. Let it free us from the things which hold us back from enjoying our lives. Let it be the thing that cleans the house, folds the laundry, assembles the IKEA furniture. <laughs> you know that meme, the meme that's like adulting, you can only have two of the five or six things every week. You can work out, you can drink eight glasses of water, you can sleep well at night, you can be present at work, you can be a good spouse, whatever. You can only have some of those things every week. You can't have it all. Sometimes when I look out beyond the immediate future, I see in my mind's eye a vision of the world where we don't have to work. <laughs> Each of us is free from wage labor because robots do it all. And we're left to consider how we might spend our time. Perhaps we would still choose to fix the car or weed the garden or bake the bread but we would do it because we wanted to, not because we had to. We would be free to experience a world in which we could devote ourselves to being in better relationship with one another and the world. Capitalism keeps us tired and running on empty, too consumed with making enough to pay our bills that we don't have the energy or the time to go to the marches, to wander the museums, to make meals for friends in need. Healthier, more interesting, more fulfilling lives. It's all very messy, isn't it? The wariness of technology, wanting to hold the line for humanity as special, which I do believe. You'll never not convince me of that. Hold that line for the beating heart over the blinking light. But also the realization that each great technological revolution has given us a bolder, bigger understanding of the world. From the tiniest atom and the Hadron Collider to the massive power of the internet, there's the dreams we have, outsized and bold, labeled as impossible and fantastical, but we have come to see some of these things pass in our lifetime that no one thought could be. And no, we aren't exactly living in the Jetsons, but artificial intelligence and robots and technology are all very much a part of being a modern person in this modern world. We need only see that there's a sharp edge to each side of this sword and to wield it with caution, aware of where the pitfalls are and who exactly is going to benefit. But may we see beyond the immediate anxiety and grief of the day. May we go further and further with our big visions for the future. May we be bold and harebrained with the hope that our children and our children's children are going to live in a radically improved world. May it be so, and amen. Hi, I'm Reverend Hannah Capaldi. And I'm Reverend Abby Tennis. We are the ministers at the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, where our mission is to awaken love and justice in our lives and in the world. We're so grateful that you watched, and we hope that the sermon connected with your soul. We also want to invite you to join us for a live worship service every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can always find the link to that service on our website at www.philauu.org. In these services, you'll hear words like you've just heard, and you also get a chance to greet one another, pray together, sing together, and we even hold a virtual coffee hour after services to get a chance to greet some new and old friends. If you want to support the mission of this community and you feel moved to give, you can do so by going to the website that Reverend Abby just mentioned. You can find that link below, or you can text 215-709 5095 and follow the prompts to give. 
If someone in your life needs to hear these words today, we encourage you to share this video. And again, thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you soon.